so much as we as we get officially started i wanted to do a a warm welcome, a good morning, a good afternoon. I'm Lily Ganges, a Chief Technology Community Officer at the Caper Center, an operating foundation at the intersection of technology and racial justice. Uh, we provide research, thought leadership programs, strategic partnerships, as well as invest to making sure that the diversity across the entire tech ecosystem is representative of our communities. We aim to level the playing field in tech. And because of tech, we know that tech plays an incredibly important role in our national economy. We've seen this from the size of our tech force, workforce, the wealth creation that we've seen, as well as how in our everyday lives, it, it's become part of how we even communicate with our loved ones. And yet we know that technology has the power to solve those pressing problems, especially be able to look at how can we close some of the longstanding racial and social disparities. However, we also know that communities of color Black, Latinx, Indigenous have yet to benefit from the power of technology and the potential really to uplift the economic mobility and innovation. And as we continue to see the, the world technology has played, we've seen, of course, the, the lack of representation uh, across the, all levels of the tech workforce, the underinvestment, lack of a deployment and capital to entrepreneurs. And now we're also starting to see the huge spread of mis and disinformation through all major social media platforms and its impact in our civic participation and ultimately democracy. This is why we're doubling down on the efforts to support civic engagement and tech policy organizations to help combat these real realities of combating voter suppression tactics that are being scaled and weaponized through some of the platforms. We wanna make sure that we're also helping increase voter registration and turnout in areas that have had a long history of drop-offs, especially during these elections, the, especially the midterms elections. So with the levels of high levels of mis and disinformation, we, we know that these are also tackling and disproportionately impacting our communities of color directly, resulting in suppressing votes at scale, um, uh, questioning the civil liberties that we have. And we also know that this year's midterm is already raising concerns of election integrity. However, in order for us to do our part as a private foundation, at this intersection of racial justice and technology. That's why we're super excited to be hosting this important conversation and also be supporting the mobilization of 20 plus different civic organizations across the nation, across specific areas where uh, we are seeing the disproportional impact to increase the civic engagement of communities of color online and offline. And so through being able to help build part of this infrastructure, we wanna be able to do our part to tackle the negative impacts that, we're be that we've been seeing. And so we are here today to specifically support and amplify the critical role of trusted messenger organizations that are so crucial for this midterm cycle. We we're seeing barriers of depressed voter progressive base, restrictive loss causing even more confusion, and even the varying voting days, right? Some folks don't even have centralized communications. But this is why with some of our esteemed panelists that we're gonna be introducing, we are so thankful, especially to the Full Circles team, a social impact focused consulting firm who has been instrumental in helping us guide our work with civic organizations across the nation since 2020. So with that said, and let me introduce your moderator for today, Bukenya Clanton, who is the Full Circle Senior Advisor and Lead for Political and Equity Advancement. And she's also the Director of Mississippi Southern Poverty Law Center leading um, SPLC state-based work for development, planning, and implementation of their state model. So with that said, let's all please welcome Wakena and let's get ready for a very, very important conversation as well as call to action. So Wakena, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Lily, and thank you to all of you um, for being here with us this afternoon. I am especially uh, grateful to the entire team at the KPOR Center for entrusting the Full Circle Strategies Group with the, um, the unique opportunity to help shepherd uh, your acts in activism um, and involvement with organizations who are on the ground uh, doing the work to help strengthen and secure democracy. I especially want to thank uh, Allison and Mitch and Frida, as well as the, um, the countless number of you here who have all contributed to making um, our relationship with you all a success. And so also for doubling down on all the efforts that were required, that are required in helping to strengthen and protect our democracy. 
So today I have the unique pleasure of being able to uh, bring to you some spirited, uh, insightful, informative conversations around the fight um, that is in, in preserving democracy. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to really focus on a couple of things, particularly around mis- and disinformation. Um, as many of you all may or may not be aware, but we are approximately 21 days uh, away from the most consequential election of our lifetimes. And so much lies in the balance with that, um, and which is why we took the time to bring to you some of the leading thought leaders uh, across the country who are actively doing the work of, 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 of being on the front lines and protecting and preserving God's democracy. The practice of mis and misinforming voters has been weaponized and targeted at communities of color by racist and anti-democratic actors who seek to intimidate voters of color and discourage them from participating in the democratic process. Today, we're gonna be speaking uh, to some of the leading experts um, who have studied intensely and worked intentionally in terms of countering mis and disinformation, specifically among communities of color. And so uh, join me in welcoming the president and CEO of the nation's oldest and boldest civil rights organization, the NAACP, Mr. Derek Johnson, and a, the leading subject matter expert on all things Latinx, the leader of the nation's largest organization, championing issues that directly affect the Latino community, president and CEO of Voto Latino, Mrs. Maria Teresa Comar. Now, Derek Johnson, for those of you who don't know, serves as the president and CEO of the NAACP, a title that he has held since October of 2017. Uh, he formerly served as vice chairman of the NAACP uh, National Board of Directors, as well as state president for the Mississippi State Conference of the NAACP. He's a longstanding member and leader of the association, uh, having to help guide the association through a period of re-envisioning and reinvigoration. Under President Johnson's leadership, the NAA uh, CP has undertaken such efforts as the 2018 logout Facebook campaign, pressuring Facebook after reports of Russian hackers uh, targeting African Americans um, to um, to do more and act in that regard. Um, he has um, he has led the 2020 We Are Done Dying campaign, which exposes the inequities embedded in the American healthcare system and the country at large. He was he's a Detroit native. He attended Tougaloo College in Jackson, Mississippi, and then he went on to receive his JD from South Texas College of Law in Houston, Texas. He went on to further his education and training through fellowships with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, as well as the George Washington University School of Political Management and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Uh, he's a veteran activist uh, who has dedicated his career to de defending the rights and improving the lives of Mississippians uh, as state president of the of the NAC, NAACP's Mississippi State Conference. He led critical campaigns for voting rights and equitable education. He has successfully managed two bond referendum campaigns in Jackson that brought um, uh, over $150 million in school bonds. Um, and school bonding and building improvements and $65 million towards the construction of a new convention center in Jackson, respectively. Uh, he's frequently featured on CNN, uh, MSNBC, CBS, ABC, and many other uh, outlets, advocating, often advocating on behalf of Black community and all of those who have been affected by systemic oppression and prejudice. Uh, Mr. Johnson states that the height of the NAACP is yet to be seen. It is our opportunity to seize upon our collective energy to make democracy work for our future. There will always be tools and devices, whether it's technology or otherwise, that we can leverage and use. But there is no greater tool or device than the collective whole working in unison towards a goal of securing civil rights for our future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Johnson.
Next, uh, I have the uh, the awesome opportunity to brag a little bit on on one of my favorite sheroes, someone who has been a long term champion and voice for members of the Latinx community, President and CEO of Voto Latino, Maria Teresa Kumar. She is the founding president um, of Voto Latino. She is a noted American activist and social entrepreneur. And she is Emmy nominated. Um, she's an Emmy nominated MSNBC contributor who has been seen and known to shake up the political process. She's leveraging youth, technology, and social platforms and influences through her work at Voto Latino, reaching more than 6.5 million um, people monthly. <laughs> Fast Company has named her among the 100 Creative Minds. Elle has named her among the 10 most influential women in DC. And the Hispanic, exe and Hispanic executive has named her among the 10 most influential Latinos. HBO celebrity Abla profiled her work in uh, Austin College, awarded her with the Poesy Leadership Award. She serves on the board of, of Emily's List and the World Economic Forum's Global Shapers uh, Board. She is a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader and a Council on uh, Foreign Relationships Life member. She's a graduate of Harvard's Kennedy School and the UC Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, Maria Teresa Komar. It's a pleasure to be here. Hi, Derek. Okay. Nice to see you. Yep. That was a mouthful, okay? So I know I'm here with all of this genius, these impeccable thought leaders who have been championing the work of Black and Brown communities throughout this nation for far beyond I could remember. And so on behalf of everyone who's tuned in with us today, I want to personally say thank you. Uh, thank you for your work. Thank you for your service. Thank you for taking time to be with us here today. Uh, I know that there is much more you can be doing, but you found the time to sit here and talk to us today about what's really at stake as we talk about the faith of our democracy. So I want to say thank you again, and I will pause and let y'all speak. <laughs> hey, Derek. Hello. So thank you all for putting this together. Good to see you, Maria. Good to see you, Joaquin. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. It is really such an honor to be here, Derek. I think the last time we saw each other was actually at Morehouse when the president and vice president were talking about the importance of voting rights. And nothing could be more important as we head into this election because we recognize that is the intersectional power of the black and brown vote that has resurrected the hardest part of our democracy and that is preventing the vote. So I'm glad to be in the trenches with you, Derek, and nice to have this conversation. And always grateful to the Kapoor Foundation. Uh, when folks say that you can't blindly submit a proposal, I did almost 18 years ago and they actually funded us. So super grateful to them. <laughs> Well, we are also grateful to you, Maria. And thank you for setting that stage because that's why we're here today, right? You two uh, have been leading um, and have the privilege of leading the two largest, I think, minority-led organizations uh, in the country. And as we approach this upcoming election cycle, you know, I don't know, I don't think that there's a doubt in anyone's mind how critical and how important our votes are in this process. Um, with that being said, though, can you provide some context around the political landscape, specifically as it relates to your communities? Uh, the Black and Brown communities have always been the, I would say, the crutch that holds America up. And so now, as we approach, what, three weeks away from one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime, what, what are we facing? Can you give us some insight around what the, the landscape is looking like uh, as we near the elections? Derek, do you want, to take, you want to go? You go ahead, yeah. <laughs> That's not fair, Derek. <laughs> I think we're all a little, you know, look, we are at the home stretch, but that said, early voting just started in many states. And what is going to come to fruition on election night is all the hard work of people who are piping in right now and the work of NAACP and the work of Voto Latino and endless volunteers. I like to remind everybody that we did the hardest part in 2020 when we ousted someone that was misogynistic, 
claimed uh, to be a president for all Americans, but was not. Uh, and we have the receipts to show it uh, with the January 6th commission. And so our job now is to hold the line and do exactly what we did in 2018 and 2020. Oftentimes people say, well, you know, why does my vote matter? And now we have things to show them. We have student loan debt relief. We have insulin caps for our communities. We have a raised social security. We have prescription Medicare, uh, you know, negotiations and the list goes on. And it worked because young people and young people of color in particular and communities of color in particular recognized the charge ahead of us. And that was to bring back our country and redirect it to the future that we are all inclusive. And we need to make sure we do that again. At Volta Latino in 2020, we registered and turned out 650,000 people we registered of those 83% went on and voted. To give you an idea how close this election is in, 20, in 2020 in Arizona, we registered and turned out 32,000. 19,000 of them were first time voters. Biden won that state by less than 11,000 votes. We did the same thing with allies in Georgia, in Nevada, in Texas, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And the only way we're going to be able to continue it is that people can say that they're tired, but there's no plan B. And part of the strategy for many people is to tire us out, to make us feel like there is no tomorrow. But if anything, they are, you know, people are up, are ruffled up because they actually see what we've been exercising and that is our power to the vote. Yeah, you know, I couldn't agree more. What we are witnessing is the fight for power. It is not about being fair. It, is, it isn't even about being just or operating with integrity. It is the struggle for power. And what's at stake uh, on this question of power is whether or not we will be a nation to live up to is principles as embedded in the constitution or whether or not we would develop a new norm that is embedded in apartheid and, and tribalism. Uh, that's a serious problem. And where many individuals react to the uh, big conversations, it really is the simple thing that each one of us can do. And that is to really leverage our currency called the vote to ensure our voices are heard and we determine the direction of this country. And it has to be metrically driven. I love when Maria talked very specific, how many they registered, where they did it, and the impact it's having. And that's the type of program we're doing in ACP, 22 states. Some of our priority states are all national elections. Some of the other priority two are local. We're looking at how we move the needle in congressional races where if we increase Voter participation of infrequent voters by three to five percent in targeted areas. We can make the outcome of the elections. How we can identify the states where we must get control of, of, of individuals who go and serve in U.S. Senate that really care about people and our profits. We are teetering on something that we've never seen before outside of the Civil War. And that is a great divide here. And the reason why that is taking place is because of the emergence of Black and Latino voters with Asian voters and young progressive voters and the LGBT community really showing up in their true self and so many other people who really care about inclusion and the principles of that all men and women are, in, are endowed with certain inalienable rights and that equal protection of the law should be afforded to everyone and that people are people and not corporations and people should come before corporations and the health of our planet, the, the quality of our water. You know, Joaquin, you and I, we live in Jackson, Mississippi with bad water because of people profiteering and the, the quality of our air. All of those things are at stake all only because the new minority in this country are afraid of losing power and seeing this as a zero sum game as opposed to there's enough room around the table for everyone, but everyone's voice and input need to be respected so we can shape and form public policy moving into the future. That's so good. And you all share so many gems. Now, as a moderator, I like to write down uh, little nuggets because sometimes the questions may shift a little bit. And I want to lean into something you both kind of alluded to when you mentioned the data points and just some of the issues that were a priority to people as we talk about and think about also even the power um, dynamic and struggle that we're really uh, battling right now. 
what role are you all seeing that missing disinformation kind of play in that China of, of, of harnessing of that power and how is shifting people's focus from the issues? Like what, how, how can we, um, I guess the better question is, as we think about um, the power struggle that's at play, what role does missing disinformation play in that? So I'll start this time, uh, Maria. Mis and disinformation has always been a problem in, in our election cycles. You can, you can go back to the elections of the 1920s or the 1800s. The difference between then and now is social media platforms which serve as super spreaders. And it can push this and misinformation out at a, at a speed uh, that would take some of us, you know, a few months or a year or two later realize the, the negative impact it is having. The fact that even news have been so democratized that people can customize their news to hear exactly what, what they want to hear, even if it's not news, it, it could be all fallacy. And so what we were worried about in 2006, seven, eight, nine with Fox News is now on steroids. And Fox News, as we know, have never been about news, has always been about propaganda. But when you can have social media platforms to use algorithms to target certain individuals, to recruit those in individuals to come on to in their rooms that, that's not visible to the three of us. And out of those rooms, people can be radicalized and they can carry out harmful acts. Then we have a true problem. And so we are concerned what can happen for this election cycle because that mis and disinformation is on, is on steroids where people are being organized outside of plain sight and what they do on up on election day and after still remains to be seen. And I think for, you know, I've always, you know, one of the things that we realized early on was that disinformation was very real. To give you an idea, in 2016, Latinos were reserving, getting served up ads on Facebook saying, don't stand in line, text to vote. And there was a picture of Hillary in English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. That was child's play compared to what we're seeing now, quite frankly. Uh, in 2020, we saw incendiary uh, conversations happening that were encouraging people to go to have an events. And sadly, in those where those events were taking place, we saw a surge of hate crimes around, across communities. And so things that are happening on, off online are going offline to very detrimental impact. In the Latino community, we were able to see disinformation dissuading people from getting a COVID vaccine all around government trappings. And so we actually partner with Media Matters and we created an ad program identifying what's that disinformation that's bad for the Latino community and can we create inoculations, both from getting them inoculated physically, but also from having them spread it. You're, we were so pleased. We found that when people saw our inoculation ad, they were 54 times more likely to get a COVID vaccine. That means interventions work. And as a grassroots digital organization, our job is to meet our audience where they are. For the last 18 months, we have been working very closely on identifying monitoring disinformation, but more importantly, identifying who in the Latino community is susceptible to that disinformation. And we actually uh, came back and we actually have a tool. And so the folks on this call are interested, we're happy to share it. Um, all of the information has now been uploaded to the voter file. But we have, we have provided a one to five code for someone, depending on how susceptible that they are to disinformation. One being you're down a rabbit hole and we can't help you, you need a different treatment. Five, you are, you are too smart, you don't need me at all, right? Um, and then you have what we call the squishy middle and conspiracy curious, number two and three. And we've assigned it to every single voter on the voting roll. Every single voter in the Latino community who has a surname that is identified as Latino, we can, we can actually tag them and give you a number. And to give you an idea of how the efficacy and the importance of it is, is that we took a, a district in Arizona, Greg Staten right now, he was leading by one when we were running the polls. And we were able to identify 6,000 Latino households that identified as conspiracy curious. And we ran ads and message testing so that if someone were to door knock on them, they knew exactly what ads, what, what messages to test that would basically neutralize and have them open to conversation. We ran and tested these ads and we found that the individuals who saw our ads had a 14% lift in participating in November. 
Because one of the strategies, as Derek knows, is trying to get people to not believe in either political party, to stay home, and that is a form of disenfranchisement. And so we've been able to counter that message by saying, no, your vote worked in November because you were able to get X, Y, Z. Now we need you to come out and vote again. And we're able to use this tool, though, for people who are interested in what is the misinformation people are receiving around, in the Latino community, are receiving around abortion, around, uh, around race. What is the disinformation of the race they're receiving, for example, around, uh, around the environment? And then we could find the messages that will work and only target those people who are on the fence. And we would love to work in partnership with other groups because we believe that our findings could be lent well to other communities. Maria, you took, you took my next question, which oh, I love. No. <laughs> you took my next question, but- Oh, I have uh, any problems. <laughs> We got bigger fish to fry than that, but that was so, that's fascinating. Uh, I love what you said there about how you taken that data that you were able to, to, to collect and to go back and repurpose it in a way and test it before even meeting them at the doors. Mm -hmm. We know that when we're working, particularly in our community, it takes more than one or two touches, uh, right. which means it takes more than one or $2 to make sure that we're reaching them. And so- and and then actually Netroots Nation, they basically, they every year you, you are asked to submit a new idea. And often, I mean, we competed this year against people who were starting not uh, for profits with VC backing. And we actually ended up taking the top prize because mm -hmm. of the adaptability of the tool at the local level and how local groups can also use them. I love that. Derek, did you want to jump in? I know you were trying to get in for a minute. No, and I love that approach. And what we've done is just amplify our relational organizing component mm -hmm. where we score a file, we identify what we call opportunity voters, individuals who are registered to vote, uh, but have not done so over uh, several election cycles. And we get high frequency voters and who sign up as volunteers. This year we have just over, just under 200,000. And people who live within the same jurisdiction, hopefully precinct, and we have high frequency voters contact directly opportunity voters. So it is a neighbor to neighbor conversation to take people outside of the online chatter that's, that's misleading and to talk to people who are actually participating about issues in their particular area. And it, it very similar to what Maria's talking about is peer review by Analyst Institute to see, are we able to move the needle? Because what we've learned through our research is celebrity endorsements are good, uh, but it's nothing that will replace neighbor to neighbor contact and community peer pressure. And so we that's the program we run because much of the conspiracy are from unknowns somewhere in cyberspace. But if you bring it to real people to talk about the pothole, the lack of garbage being collected and or you know, student loans being canceled, that, that, that personalize it, which give people a different level of concern and responsibility to turn out to vote. That's so good. And, and um, we have about five minutes before we open it up, well, maybe about three minutes before we open it up for uh, Q&A. But I wanted to kind of lean into something you said around volunteering, um, Derek. And we are joined here by people who are streaming us online, who are joining us here in the webinar. And so folks really want to know like how they can help, how they can lean in, particularly those folks who are here at the K4 Center and those who are affiliated with the K4 Center are really interested in terms of like what they can do to help. And so I want to give you all each an opportunity to kind of share a little bit more about how you are directed, to, like how you are um, building out your volunteer camps and how they can lean into those uh, specific things. Oh, for us, I mean, it's online in acp.org. Uh, we have a button for volunteer and we will route you right into the system if you want to volunteer for this election cycle. We will run, the, you know, if you agree, we will run, see where you fall on the, the voter scale, whether or not you are a high frequency voter and then partner with you with some with 10 people in your community, whether you email, phone call or, uh, or text message. Very similar, if folks want to volunteer, go to votolatino.org and you'll find the volunteer section. For us, our volunteers are critical lifeblood of our work. I don't know about you, Derek, but we have found very lackluster investment in Latino voter registration and turnout this election cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, we 
Uh, and, and it's hard because we know what works. And so our volunteers make all the difference. I mentioned the ads that I that we know are effective by for, uh, getting a, a Latino voter to go from maybe I'm going to vote to 15, a 14% lift that they want to vote. No one's interested in getting them because everybody's fatigued. And I keep saying that fatigue is a, you know, it, it is a symptom of the privileged uh, because as communities of color, we have no choice to be fatigued. We have to make sure that we're fighting for our democracy. So for folks, if they want to volunteer last in 2020, we trained up over 7,000 volunteers. We did Zoom nights, we did slacking. And those 7,000 volunteers contacted 5.9 million low propensity voters in eight battleground states. They contacted mm -hmm. them in Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Florida, Texas, North Carolina, Wisconsin, uh, Arizona, and Nevada. And shocking, those are the same states that we're looking for again. So please, please, please. I know Gally, who char is charged with our volunteer services, she would be super pleased to get a couple of folks on board. But I do think that you know our challenge at VL is that when we talk, folks talk about Latinos not being a monolith, they talk about it as a country of origin. And what we're finding is actually very generational. And so we are looking for our volunteers to help us target young people. To give you an idea, in, 20, in 2012, Latino youth represented 68% of people who cast a ballot in 2012. That number 2014 went down to 11%. And then it went back up to 39% in, in 2018 that made sure that there was a strong democratic vo progressive voice in the Senate. And our challenge right now is that campaigns have a tendency of wanting to fund high propensity voters. But when 60% of Latino voters are under the age of 33, they're not going to get a touch if it's not for organizations like the NAACP or Voto Latino. So we need all the help we can get. Amazing. And so I always like to leave us with like a little scare. To, it is October, by the way. So for those of you who are into Halloween, this could be a really scary question for you. But today, imagine this, the date is November 9th. If we don't all do what we need to do, what would be the headline? Well, that's not an option. And so, you know, I recall 2016, November. By 11 p.m., it was obvious that things were not going to turn out the way it should. And I was so, I won't call it depressed, but another word for depressed, that I didn't turn the news on until mid-January. I didn't want to read the news. Uh, and for me, I was in Mississippi, and I had to go to our state convention and speak to the delegates and give words of encouragement about the next step. And it went something like this. We've seen this before, but we must continue to fight because when we fight, we win. And even though there are setbacks, we continue to fight. Our system of governance cannot continue to sustain the direct blows to our democracy and expect to have the other democracy on the other side. So we wake up, we have to prepare for the next fight, and that's 2024. While at the exact same time, begin to give more people outside of our respective communities to understand that our democracy cannot continue to take these blows. And there is no substitute than, than, than a, rep, a representative governance structure that represent all the people, not some of the people, because if you limit representation, you endanger the lives of individuals. And so whether it's working poor whites, at some point the bell must be rung that they have to be a part of this too. Whether it's white women who on one side they speak loud about issues they care about but quietly vote the wrong way at the polls in my opinion, the bell must be rung, they have to do something too. Whether it's white guys in middle management who, is trying, who, are, who have been sold a bill of goods mm -hmm. to recognize that the democracy that their grand parents or great-grandparents fought for in wars will not exist. And so if I wake up that morning, that's the message we have to carry forward because the, the transaction of one election is only part of the battle. The real question is, how do we get to a place where we can reverse the course that we're on? Maria, November 9th, what's the headline? Honestly, it's up to us. I, we, did, we did the hardest part, and I'm not kidding. In 2018, 
we organized and it was the most participation in hundred years in our midterm election. And it paid off because we had the most diverse Congress in our nation's history. The most women, the most African-American, the most Latino, the most LGBTU, the most veterans, the youngest, I mean, all of it. And when people say, well, why does diversity matter? We had 400 pieces of legislation that demonstrated our values that the house passed because we showed up mm -hmm. and we finished the job in 2020 and we have those receipts. Mm -hmm. And so the people are saying that they are tired. It's like, we, we cannot afford to be tired because we are right now in the eye of the storm and our job is not done because you know what? There's more of us than there are of them. Since 2020, we have six more million young Latino, uh, six more million young people of color. Two thirds of them are African-American and Latino that are eligible to vote in this election cycle. We need to invite them into the conversation because right now the people voting, we're ancestoring for our future. And if we lose, we are ancestoring for a future that is not inclusive of the people on this call and the children right now who are in kindergarten. And that is on us. And so I appreciate people saying that they're fatigued, but this is not where we are to be fatigued. We are in battle. And if Derek couldn't illustrate it more, we are in the battle for the soul of our country, for our democracy, not just in America, but we are the beacon of hope for everybody else. Imagine what would happen if we do not hold on to this democracy for other ethnic minorities around the, around the world. They look to us. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. Are we still part of that trajectory of trying to be more inclusive? Yes. Yeah. It's because we are at the table. And the moment we decide to set it out, that is part of their strategy because you better believe they will show up. So our job is to be with loving grace, inclusive moving forward, but making sure that we are casting that out and that we're casting it early so that there is no, 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 no doubt that we're participating. And what gives me hope is that as of last week, we have already surpassed 2 million early votes. That's a surge. Georgia has already is meeting voter registration participation at the booth. I think, I believe they opened up yesterday at the same mm -hmm. levels that they saw in 2020. That's what we need to have a conversation around. We don't need to read the headlines. We just need to put our head down and do the work because that's how we do it. We know how to do this. And you know, to that point, speak from a, uh, a surplus mindset not a deficit mindset. Right. It isn't a question of fatigue because I really don't hear voters say that. I hear commentators say that. I hear, you know, in these I conversations. It drives That's me right. nuts, we're but, honest. But, <laughs> but when I go to Kroger, when I go to wherever, people ask, you know, about what's taking place, what could they do? Or they are responding to say, this is awful. We got to do something better. That's right. what I'm hearing. The That's sense right. of urgency is what we should put forward, not the sense of despair. That's right. I love that. I love all of this. I have so many notes from this. I particularly love ancestoring for our future. That is the best way that I've ever heard that put, but also uh, the surplus mindset, Derek, you're absolutely right. We have to speak hope into our futures, uh, into our present. So I do appreciate you both for uh, indulging us in this conversation. We do have one question and I'm gonna take time for it. We have three minutes on the clock. So I wanna make sure that we get this question in because I believe it's super important because we often focus a lot on federal elections, mm -hmm. right? And we put all of our eggs in the basket of DC, but we forget about the, the hen house down here in the States. And so uh, I wanna pro pro uh, propose this question to the group. It says, what recommendations can you offer to get voters engaged in local regional issues at the city council, mayoral and school board uh, levels, uh, including statewide propositions, regional bond and sale tax measures, et cetera? Well, just make it relevant. You know, just recently we were really active in Shelby County, Tennessee district attorney's race. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a race that uh, the, whoever win, they serve a term of office for eight years. Uh, Shelby County over indexed in mass incarceration compared to the rest of the state. It is also the county that holds the city of Memphis. The DA that was the incumbent refused to accept DA evidence, among other things. Uh, she was a huge trumper. And as we, when we looked at the data, we realized that not only was it a winnable race, it only took people to understand the authority and the power of the district attorney because they have full discretion on who gets charged, who's not charged, what crimes people are charged for. And they had a lot of discretion on, on exonerating individuals who were falsely convicted. But, uh, and they had a DA that was harmful to the community. And as a result of that, and organizing in that community, 
Not only did we win the district attorney race in Shelby County in August, but we also got elected a, a, a juvenile justice court judge that was overly incarcerating young people because of the increased turnout. Once people understood the power of a district attorney, once people understand the power of a, a county sheriff, the power of a mayor, the power of you name the local office, you get increased turnout. And in most states, unfortunately, if you look at the, not unfortunate, if you look at the, the turnout when you have a presidential election or a governor election, the county sheriff and many times outperform the top of the ticket because people understand the power of law enforcement. So it's incumbent upon us to help people really understand the power of the elected official or the elected office that, that been on the ballot that particular year and how it impacts their lives and the future for their children. That's beautiful. That's and wonderful. The thing, and you know, the only thing I would add is that start consider running for office yourself. Yeah. We we need a bench. And one thing that I have learned is that no one knows what their community needs than the people on the ground, the people are, that are on the opposite side facing unjust laws and policies. And so I would encourage you to consider running for office. We need more of you. There's a great organization called Run for Something. They will teach you the nuts and bolts. And I love to see fresh faces because that's what scares them is the way you change policy is being at the table. Well, listen, I have enjoyed being at the table with you two today. This is civil rights genius at its height. And so I really, really enjoyed these nuggets that you shared. For folks who may have missed it, let me recap it for you. Uh, if you want to do the job of getting people involved at the local levels, you must make it relevant for them. You have to understand the power of the positions, know the facts. And if all else is not available to you, consider running for yourself. Thank you so much, Maria Teresa. Thank you so much, Derek Johnson, for joining us today. This was an amazing panel, and we thank you again deeply for your work out into in, in within our community. So 21 days to go. Let's get it done. Thank you thank all. You. Thank you. Such a treat. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. All right. All right. So I hope you all have enjoyed uh, this first panel, I know I did. I, I think I have way too much paper uh, over here from all of the notes that I was able to take um, in this conversation. Um, next up is one, is another panel of dynamic um, uh, movement leaders, uh, I should say. I, I have the good fortune of knowing all three of them, uh, many uh, who I have had the pleasure of growing under their tutelage and growing in their friendship. And so I will uh, take this opportunity to introduce to you Reverend Barbara William Skinner, who is the CEO and founder of the Skinner's Institute. <sighs> Uh, Ms. Dewana Thompson, who is the founder of Woke Boat and co-founder and principal at Think Rubik's LLC. And Mr. Damian Hewitt, who is the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Hey, family. Hello. Hey. Hello. How are y'all doing today? Hello. Great. I'm so excited to talk to y'all. Uh, I know I don't know if y'all had a chance to hear the previous discussion with Derek and no, Maria no. Teresa, but we're going to continue on in that same vein for this one. Um, we know you all are doing the critical work around voting rights protections, uh, faith involvement, as well as youth involvement uh, in this upcoming election. And so just think of this as a continuation on of that fireside chat. You know, we couldn't have all of you brilliant minds together in one setting. We would never get through the conversation. And so uh, I'm really happy to kind of pick up here with you all. And so since we were speaking about misinformation, I want to kind of continue a little bit in that vein. And Damien, I'm actually going to ask you um, this first question to kind of help prompt us uh, a little bit uh, in the conversation. And then we'll talk a little bit more, more in depthly around the faith and the youth vote involvement um, in this upcoming election, if that's okay mm -hmm. with y'all. Okay, it don't matter. I'm moderating anyway, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I love y'all. Um, so as we all know, um, there seems to be just like this never ending slot of, again, crisis that arise in our country. Uh, we are approaching an election cycle that is also being met by uh, pandemics on top of epidemics and the, the need for uh, more concise 
participation from members of our civil rights and social justice community um, is, is paramount. And so as we continue on and think about the work we have to do as we look at the landscape, understand that there are so many mi mixed messages that are infiltrating the space. Uh, Damien, specifically for you, what, what is the work that you all are doing over at the Lawyers Committee, uh, specifically as it relates to one, uh, providing some protections around missing and disinformation, but also ensuring that we are strengthening the legal infrastructure that is necessary to sustain us as we approach these upcoming elections? Sure. Well, well thank you, Akini, for your leadership and your energy uh, and your vision and for being moderate in your moderation. I appreciate it. Uh, so look, you know, I think as, as Derek and Maria Teresa said, there is so much energy in our communities that people take for granted. Uh, they tried to tell us for 100 years that we were anti-intellectual, right? Mm -hmm. When we know that it was laws on the books in most Southern states that made it illegal for Black people uh, to, to learn how to read and write, right? So th there is some, th there's been misinformation and disinformation for a long time. And so the number one most important thing we can do and that we're doing at the Lawyers Committee with our partners around the country, many of whom have been part of this amazing program, is to get out the truth. Get the truth out. Uh, we need prophylactic information, not just after the fact, but ahead of time to get people accurate information about not just who's running for what and what their positions are, the people who do that, but about what your rights are, what your rights continue to be, even in this ever-changing landscape where we know that we have this combination of voter suppression laws that are designed to make it harder for people to vote. That includes drop boxes, absentee, vote by mail, in-person requirements, these tricky signature matches where in Texas, one in eight uh, absentee ballots or mail ba ballots were invalidated in the primary election because of this little tricky thing. And then the Florida people being charged and prosecuted after being uh, entrapped and told that they could uh, regain their right to vote, right? So we see all these things happening. So we have to get the message and the truth out prophylactically. We do that with our partners around the country. Uh, we don't have bodies on the ground at Lawyers Committee, but we got a lot of friends uh, in every community uh, through the National Election Protection Coalition, almost 300 organizations covering about three dozen different states where our communities, where our people are primarily, uh, getting that word out, covering things on the ground and responding when people call the hotline. I'll give you just this, this one quick example. I won't take up too much time. Uh, in the 2020 cycle, we got a tip to the hotline about robocalls going out to Black voters saying that if you vote by mail, then uh, your information will be used to track you down to execute outstanding warrants. It will be used to collect outstanding debts by your creditors, and it will be used to force mandatory vaccines by the CBC. Essentially, think twice before you vote by mail. That was designed to have a chilling effect on Black people exercising their rights safely. And we got that tip to the election protection hotline and acted on it. And the National Coalition on Black Civic Participation, Sister Melanie Campbell stood up as the organizational plaintiff and client in that case. The people who did that, we sued them until they can't cry anymore and they've been prosecuted too. So we gotta use every tool in our toolkit to stand up right. for our folks. Yes. And just have uh, activates, you got to have some litigation uh, as well. Uh, I really love that. And what you spoke about in terms of getting out the truth and being prophylactic and in, in getting that information out um, is really, is really important. It's very key, specifically as we talk about vessels and trusted vessels of information. And Dr. Skinner, uh, as someone who has been leading um, in the faith fight for so long, as long as I can remember, I want to one say thank you for your impeccable service and your commitment to ensuring uh, that the faith community's role in this is never lost. Uh, and so we thank you again for all of those of you who are faith uh, united to save democracy. We really do appreciate that. Uh, can we talk about a little bit about the role that the church plays in getting out that pro prophylactic truth and how, because we've seen this over the years in terms of like religious leaders try to trend away from being civically involved, right? They want to throw their own politicizing, but they're escaping something in the midst of trying to be anti quote unquote political from the pulpit. Can you speak a little bit about the role and the responsibility that religious and faith led organizations and entities play in helping us save democracy? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for having me. And we 
Uh, love that question because the context of it really is where we are right now. We are in a crossroads or crosshairs between white minority rulership and a, 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 a multiracial democracy. That's what we're fighting for. That's what the battle is right now. And it was the 2000 census. And I know my, the others understand this. It was a 2000 census announcement that by 2045, there will be no majority race that has unleashed a torrent, which the Lawyers Committee and LDF and others are fighting from Shelby to uh, Charlottesville to, you know, Mother Emanuel to right on up to uh, George Floyd and beyond. OK, we can't even list all of the uh, activities, the racist activities and, and the hatred and the harm that has been met on black and brown communities from this, this, this battle to maintain rulership, even though the white population is now at 52% when it was 85% in 1960. Okay, so that's the battleground in which we're even dealing with voting rights right now. Okay, the black church has been an amazing, I think, shift uh, from this nonsense about separation of church and state that has been fed to them by largely, in some cases, by white evangelicals who are no longer buying into that, okay. Um, and, and understanding that if justice is God's business, it has to be theirs. Mm -hmm. if, if 34 million Americans of every race can't get a wheelchair who are disabled or you know, can't get, or, or language uh, difficult people, or um, in 40% of the polling sites in the low income black community don't have wheelchair ramps. In North Carolina, 1.1 million Latinos, no ballots in Spanish. I'm saying those are justice issues. And we've had between probably 2014 and now, um, 2014, when we started working actually with the Lawyers Committee on the midterm in 2014, uh, to help the Black church understand its historic role. Because it, it, historically, the Black church is the root of the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Tragically, after about 1970, many went away from that. And now we're trying, now we're, we're, we're mobilizing denomination leaders, independent churches, uh, digital churches, and, and now beyond the black church into a multiracial, multi-faith and multi-generational movement because it, it, it has to bother us if synagogues are being burned or, or mosques are being burned. It can't be just about black people. Uh, we need allies. We have white mainline churches working with us. And so I'm happy to report that as of today, uh, our goal is a 2000 poll chaplain in 10 states uh, we are probably about halfway there. We're doing training right now. In fact, today at four o'clock, we have a third in a series of trainings that are going on uh, to help people understand how to serve. We're connected at the hips with the one eight six six our vote hotline. We're grateful for the partnership with the Lawyers Committee over the years. Uh, but I think the biggest issue for us is frankly getting still a small segment of our population understand that it's not political when you can't give food and water yeah. in Georgia yeah. and other states. That's, that's a good Samaritan act. It's that's not political if someone is blind and you don't have a braille reader there. Okay, so I think that we're, we're not there yet, but I'm excited that in every one of our states, we're mobilizing poll chaplain of every race and background and people understand it's all our fights. We're either gonna have a white minority rulership after this election or in toward 2024, or we're gonna move closer to a multiracial democracy. That's the battle that the church wants to be and continues to be at the forefront of. And I'm excited about the younger church leaders, the young senior pastors and our millennial pastors we're getting involved in this battle. We just had a gospel fest in Tallahassee last week. We're having a 
you know, uh, in Florida, we're having another set of prayer breakfasts and prayer brunches. So we're doing it digitally. We're doing it every way we can. We can't, we need every soldier in this battle. And I'm thrilled to see that people are coming out and they're coming out strong. They believe this is their country too. And they're standing up to fight for it. Thank you so much, Dr. Skinner. I'm always just so enthralled. Every time you speak, I feel newly motivated and excited about um, just the work you're doing, but also the call um, that is placed upon all of us through the process. So we definitely appreciate you for that. Um, now, Dewana. Yes, ma'am. Wanda Twin. Um, <laughs> there, there are reports that we have more than 8 million newly eligible youth voters this election cycle. And I know that Woke Vote has been doing um, impeccable work around training folks on the ground to lean into these elections, to go into college campuses and really um, be intentional about their outreach to youth. Uh, but in that same vein, we hear all of the misinformation that's going to be a theme of the day uh, that is spread around the youth vote and the in yeah. the youth apathy around the voting process. Can you speak to some of what you've heard and experienced on the ground and what shifts do you see on the horizon? Yeah, uh, first of all, I'm just honored to be here with both Dr. Barbara Skinner, uh, William Skinner and Damon and, and yourself as well. But I think, um, when we talk about misinformation, we're really still talking about voter intimidation and voter suppression, because what it does is it labels a group. It says to that group, um, here's who you are versus here's what you are actually doing. And so it begins to creep in in a way that we don't appreciate. And we think that this has been happening specifically when it comes to the youth and young adult vote for a very long time. The more you hear, oh, young people don't care, the more it starts to creep into the culture of how we actually engage them. And so what I like to challenge is that youth and young adults have had, if you look at the numbers of turnout in the last three elections, the highest increase in voter turnout has been between the ages of 18 and 30 period, across the board with any other group. They outbeat every other voting demo uh, demographic um, in terms of their increase over the last three election cycles. So what that tells me is that there is a disconnect between those who are engaging and, and the ground and the youth, which we happen to see all the time. And so one of the things that we um, are encouraging or have been encouraged by is that I will say that our young voters are less likely to align with political parties. And I think it's important to understand that you may not, if you're looking at it from how many young people sign up to join the DNC or the RNC or any other political thing, you may then be able, th that could color an idea around whether or not voters, you know, young voters are engaged. But the, there has been a very significant disconnect between the way in which parties show up and support the issues that young voters care about. So they don't necessarily see that that, uh, that I would say traditional structure as the way in which they get out to get activated. They do, however, understand and are coming into a larger understanding of using the vote as a tool and a strategy, which to something I think Dr. Um, Barbara Skinner said earlier, um, back, back in the day, the strategy of the vote was taught at mass meetings. Right, where you had intergenerational conversations around this is how we are actually going to build power. And we lost a little bit of that, um, I think, over the years. And so we are having to reinstill the understanding that voting is a tool, it's a powerful tool for your strategy of liberation. And so that is what we're, we are able to sort of say to, to our young people. And as we are on right now, I mean, just this week alone, we'll be on. 20 or 19 HBCU campuses um, across about four different states. And it's being led by those students. We aren't, you know, uh, propelling in with, you know, with, you know, our, myself, I'll be 40 uh, in a few days. And so, you know, I don't consider myself to be the person who needs to be speaking on that college campus. We have to invest and we have invested in the leadership of the young folk who are already on those campuses or are in those communities that surround those campuses. 
and we ask them, what are the ways that you believe that we can in, engage your community? What are the things that your peers care about? And we, we find that we are so much more successful when we let them lead the work um, and let them sort of plan the strategy around how they're going to engage their peers, um, that they actually turn out and get engaged and stay engaged um, at a higher rate. And so that is our goal to use the election cycles to help them to understand um, the power of the vote as a strategy, but really to keep them activated when it's not election time, because that builds their, their power and their capacity. So that's what we're seeing right now. Um, I, I do not see a, a drop in, in the way in which youth and young adults are getting activated in this current election cycle. In fact, I see them very activated and very motivated uh, for the things that they care about. This is so important because I think people, when they even the narrative sometimes drives the strat the investment strategy. Yes. It's really important for us to get out as much information about what's real uh, in the spaces as is possible and also who's doing the work, the type of work that we need to move. Now, like as we think about the work that each of you all are doing, we know we have a, an extremely committed team of folks here at the K4 Center and through K4 affiliates who are really interested in how they can help. And so I want you all to really think through this question as I ask it, because you're doing the work, like the seed work, the voter, Dewana, you spoke very specifically around the tactics of voter suppression and intimidation. And so Damien, I'm gonna actually shift to you first. And so to give you an opportunity to speak a little bit more about what you all are doing and how folks at the K4 Center and K4 affiliates can be helpful in the work that which you're doing. And then we'll come to you, Dr. Skinner, then back to you, Dewana. Sure, well, look, K4 and, and your allies and friends and many of your grantees in the Bay Area and around the country, you know tech. Uh, and you know we've been getting to know tech pretty well ourselves at the, at the Lawyers Committee and other civil rights organizations because big tech is influencing uh, our lives, it's influencing our opportunities, it's influencing democracy. Now, you know, we're in an environment where information and data are like currency, like they're valuable, right? Just like money. Yeah. Uh, and that's exactly why some of these companies want our data and our information about us to make uh, decisions and create algorithms and use artificial intelligence to uh, arguably be more efficient, but really to take shortcuts uh, to help other people make decisions. And sometimes, many times, those decisions do not inure to the benefit. In fact, they inure to the detriment of the Black community. Now, we've worked with tech platforms, major platforms, to promote good information and accurate information about elections. And some of them are really trying uh, to, to do that. Uh, you know, as much as we wish they were kind of <laughs> stay in a different business, we want to help them do it well if they're going to do it. But, you know, real collaboration with tech starts with accountability. Uh, you know, I think there's a couple of things to understand. One is that the dis and the misinformation is not just a seasonal or episodic thing around election time. It happens every day, 365 days a year. Remember, there was also mis and disinformation used to uh, both surveil and also fracture black movement leaders, right? right. Uh, to pit people against each other. So that wasn't around an election, that was all throughout a year. And that probably is still going on and still happening. And it's now been well documented. Uh, and it's hurt a lot of movements, quite frankly, on the progressive side. Uh, we also have to understand that businesses, especially on social media platforms, they are selling a product. Their product, uh, their consumer good is engagement. And so they want to do things that make people engage. Well, it just so happens that the human brain, at least in this country, people look at outrageous content as things that they want to engage with. So the more outrageous, almost the more it sells, the more salacious, the more it sells. That's why you see this proliferation of racist content, white supremacist ideology, uh, so-called snuff videos, uh, people being, our people being killed, just like in the Buffalo massacre, the New York AG's office issued a report today basically saying that it's almost impossible to get some of this stuff offline, including videos of the Buffalo massacre where our people were murdered just going shopping. It's just ridiculous. So when we talk about accountability with big tech, we have to really understand that these algorithms produce harmful content. A recent report earlier this month found that a well-crafted lie gets more engagement than the truth. It's actually harder to lift up the truth. And the tech companies know this and they're making a lot of money for it. And so we are pushing, hopefully with support from K-Port Center uh, and other allies, we're pushing to draw a line in the sand. At the very least, 
uh, when these algorithms are used to generate a profit for companies, that should trigger some form of responsibility. And sometimes responsibility means liability. But even when there's no profit motive, there has to be a moral imperative uh, to not allow these things to happen. So whether it be impacting democracy, whether it be impacting uh, movement leaders, whether it be impacting just people's daily lives, we need the K4 Center and, and others uh, to help us draw a line in the sand uh, to hold big tech accountable. Damien, thank you so much for that. Accountability and, transpar and transparency are both key components and key tenants of the K4's technology and equitable priorities uh, here at the center. So it's it, um, great to hear that we are in alignment around those things and, champ and particularly as it relates to artificial intelligence and racial profiling. Those are things that are really um, particularly of importance to the folks here at the K4 Center. And I love the fact that you see responsibility sometimes equates to liability. So <laughs> um, that's good as well. Dr. Skinner. Yes, I think that the uh, what we have had is um, a fortunate situation, even through COVID for the, the Black church on technology. As you recall, three years ago, uh, it was only the younger pastors who really used technology, mega churches and the like. Uh, it what has happened is for the sake of survival, of course, uh, almost all black churches now have had to go tech. Mm -hmm. All now the problem with that is there was there weren't the support systems there. You talk about how can Kapoor help? A lot of the help we're getting during this election season needs to happen after this season to get people ready for the next season. Mm. See, we got a lot of help in the three months before. We got maybe resources before or whatever. This kind of conversation about the digital divide, particularly rural churches, that is where the vote is going to be the hardest to get. In Savannah and Augusta and places like that, in rural Mississippi and the like. So I think Kapoor could help by hosting webinars and the like after the election, but way before the 2024 election where people understand what is available. Um, that I mean, I think that's the biggest issue. I can't agree more with what um, was just said uh, by Damon Hewitt about holding big tech accountable and the algor algorithms and all that really hurt our people. But there are some helpful things. For example, we're working now with uh, Verizon and, um, and Microsoft to do uh, to get the uh, um, the kind of broadband expansion for rural churches. I mean that's a that's a very specific way that uh, that technology can be it can be harmful, but it can be helpful. I'd like to focus on how you can help going forward. You're a leader in that. Uh, this is your space that you occupy. Uh, we're going to have you know all the issues of our world are not going to be settled in 21 days. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna need to come back together, debrief, and look at where we are. Uh, were there some online issues with the voting machinery and others that technology could have helped? Uh, could we have been done better with Braille or or with language issues and the like? Uh, could we have could we perhaps get more people, you know, on the um, uh, an app? Uh, on their smartphone to help with voting and the like, particularly as my sister talked about so beautifully, the younger voters uh, getting, we have an app now for Skinner Leadership Institute because we're trying to introduce our churches to utilizing the app where they can get in group text by state and text each other and have some, uh, some early warning and alert systems if something goes wrong. For example, we don't know, we don't know about the threats of violence, whether they're real or not. Uh, lawyers committee doesn't know. we don't know but what we do know is that the more we can put people in touch with technology where we have an instant way to communicate with one another in real time uh that is going to beat down some of the fear that people have about even getting out so i want to say that we got to make technology our friend but we got to understand it's not evenly divided everybody with a cell phone Everybody with a computer doesn't know how to use it. So we it's not just older, younger. It's our whole community has got to get tech savvy and, and uh, for us to be uh, at the level that we need to be going forward after this election. 
Thank you, Dr. Skinner. Um, and just for folks, in case you missed it, help is needed just as much after the election as it is leading into the election. That's key. Uh, Joanna, on to you. Yeah, I think um, a couple of things as I was thinking, because my colleagues here have said some incredible things. I think we have to first remember that tech has to be aligned, at least if you are really trying to do equitable tech, it has to be aligned with the individuals that it seeks to serve, correct? And so if you are not, if you are building a system or a piece of technology and you have not included what I consider peer thought leaders into the process of how you build that thing. So if you have not, if you're building something that's supposed to help students on college campuses, but you haven't included any voices from college campuses in the way you build that technology, then what you are doing is something good but you're not doing it well and so we keep trying to encourage tech companies to as they are advancing in their strat tech strategy as they're thinking about you know what it means to have um you know tech equity it starts with how you build it from the beginning. What is your um, theory of change or analysis of how you're going to, or who's going to use this from the beginning? Because many times the reason why it's not working, as Dr. Uh, Skinner talked about earlier, is because it's not considering the audience for which it's going to be utilized, right? Um, and so, so we need the front end um, to be considered as well as making sure that once the tech is created, that there are tools and you know templates in place to help people understand how how to use it. The second thing I would say um, that I was, was thinking here is that the way in which um, we use, so if many of you probably know, I'm, a, I'm an organizer by, by heart. I, I, I'm on the ground all the time. And so even when the, the, the technology that we use to knock on doors now, to make phone calls, all of those things, um, depending on where you are and your ability to, to, to access internet um, and all those things, it very much cripples the way in which engagement happens on the ground. And so we have, um, we're very, I still go back to if, if we don't, if we can't get internet in a rural place, they print out walk sheets. It just is what it is, right? So we can't necessarily, I think part of, I've always told them like, don't abandon all of the traditional systems because of their, because there's technology. But how can Kapoor help with that is making sure that what the data that's going into the systems, that is, that we have ways to make sure it's accurate. Because even if we are printing a list or we're keeping the list on our phone, if it's not accurate, accurate data, then we are out there engaging you know, in ways that um, are not helpful uh, and are not going to reap the benefit of the, the actual interaction. And so I want to be sure that the way in which the data is being used, uh, we, I think uh, my brother Damon talked about this earlier. Um, for me, a lot of times I went to, I spoke at a conference called Data uh, for Black Lives. And one of the conversations was around the fact that the way in which data is resourced and the way in which it is pro processed has a it shows up with the bias on the front end. Well, tech, in my opinion, does the same thing. And so we have to be sure that we don't have, um, you know, unconscious biases uh, as a way that in, in the way we're building the tech and the way that we are putting in the data, the way we're, you know, we're, we are utilizing the data um, to make sure that we are not missing people. And there's something that, um, if you know the, the the wonderful Reverend Michael McBride, it's something that he always says to us. He says that, and um, and it's something he heard from a mentor, which is an un, an organized lie will beat out disorganized truth every single time. And what happens is with technology, that lie gets to people so much faster <laughs> than the truth does. And a lot of times, those of us who have the truth don't have access to the technology, that fast technology that moves. So whether that is being able to um, multiply a, 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 an, an ad online, you know, working with those, those entities, they have said that certain things cannot be posted, you know, online in terms of how we get out uh, voter engagement. And so we're not able to get those resources out so making sure that there's a strategy that really helps us to amplify the truth over the noise thank you so much Dewana. and uh, a quick time check for those of you who are interested in asking questions we encourage you to go ahead and put those in the q a and in, in the chat just so that we can um provide those to the panelists but as we wait for those to come in i do have a question um for you all and that question is what issue is top of mind um, for you that should move folks to the polls in November? And uh, Dewana, I'll start with you. 
Well, um, as some of you may know, in some of our wonderful Southern states, Alabama being where I hail from, slavery is still on the ballot. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> the fact that it's still there um, and essentially um, without going into all the details, essentially people will go and if they don't know that that thing is on the ballot, they will probably skip it because it's not on the ballot literally as do you think slavery is right or wrong? It is all, but depending on the state constitutions, for instance, it's on the ballot in Louisiana as well. Um, depending on what the, the, your state constitution, there is language on there that has have been ratified that needs to be re-ratified to keep slavery off the ballot. So the language itself could be a little bit tricky if you haven't done the due diligence of knowing that it's even on there. So for us, part of the work that we're doing with WOPVO and our young students and, and young folk across particularly southern states is working on ensuring that everybody knows first of all that that is on the ballot in states like Alabama and Louisiana and that they understand what language to look for so that they don't skip that and part of that is just teaching people again how to vote the whole ballot and making sure that you're not just voting for one thing that you understand that every single thing on there actually impacts your life so ensuring that they don't skip any questions but the the, and, the, and the reason why they're not skipping it and hoping that we're, we're ensuring that the reason why they wouldn't skip it is because they don't understand it. So making sure that we have the resources and the tools out there, but that slavery clause that's on the ballot in several of our Southern states, that is the most, um, that is the thing that is driving our work right now. And that has motivated a lot of the young people that we're working with. Damien. Sure, I, I think it's so smart. What Sister Dewan is doing is to, break issues down of, of, of local, local, national, international significance. And I also want to add to that, trying to get us to be what they call chronic voters, or I'll call it chronic pains in the butt, or the people who don't want us to vote. Because what I would say is on the ballot is you are on the ballot. We are on the ballot. Because there are people who, in many states around the country, Alabama included, did everything they could to make it as hard as possible for you to vote. And they're sitting back, ready to light their cigars and smoke one while we're out there floundering. That's what they want to see. And so we, we're on the ballot, right? This is not even about, it's about what you're voting for, not against, for sure, right? But as addition to voting for the issues, let's vote for ourselves. Let's make sure that we have a plan, that we make a plan, whether we're connecting with lawyers and collars and African-American clergy network whether we're connecting with election protection and the 866 our vote hotline, whether you're connecting with a political party, right? That's okay too, right? Uh, if you're connecting uh, and you're getting your information, legal women voters, whomever, uh, mobilize, energize, make that plan and cast your ballot. And you will be more than your ancestors' wildest dreams. You'll be defying the devil in real time. Damien, repeat that voter uh, protection hotline again for folks sure. in case they need it to saving in their phones. <laughs> sure. 866 our vote. O U R V O T E. Our vote. Remember you are on the ballot. Uh, Dr. Skinner. Yeah, let me build on both of their amazing comments. One, I say your life is on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Your ability, your right to be in America is on the ballot. And we're saying that over and over without any fear of contradiction, because that is truth. Uh, people are understanding that when, when your, your vote is so serious that people are stealing it, something that, that your citizenship is at stake, your citizenship as an American. So I think people are getting that, young people are getting that, older people are getting that. I think something that um, Ms. Thompson said is so critical is that People will not admit that when they walk into the into the voting booth, they often do not know anything but the top two people on the ballot. They don't know of those five sheriffs you pick two, what are their track records of school boards that are now very politicized? What have their track record been about teaching all of our American history, good, bad, and in between? So if you don't do that due diligence in between, it's a problem. So in our what's at state uh, meetings and our webinars earlier in the year, starting in April of this year with all of those 10 states, the first thing we did was teach our pastors how to read the ballot and then how to do their, their Facebook live gatherings with their churches on how you read that ballot. If you don't understand the constitutional amendment, 
then let's have a meeting, a seminar in the church about what will that budget change do to our community, our schools, our neighborhoods, our streets, you know, our services and the like. And so I think the intelligent chronic voter is what, <laughs> to use Damon Hewitt's word, is what we're trying to get people to see that walk, getting out to vote is one step. Knowing what's on the ballot is really makes you a serious, mm -hmm. uh, I think you're a serious uh, advantage to the community. What we don't need is a lot of blank spaces because not voting is a vote against your own interest. Dr. Skinner, Dewana Thompson, Damon Hewitt, thank you all so much for just being uh, who you are, which are these incredible uh, civil rights, social justice warriors who keep our issues front and center, who keep our communities informed and engaged and activated and protected. We greatly appreciate you for that. Uh, I want to just close us out on a couple of nuggets that, that were shared in this panel. Tech must align with individuals it's been intended to serve. Uh, accountability plus responsibility sometimes looks like liability. Uh, help is needed after the election, just as much as it is leading into the elections. And most importantly, when you vote, remember that you are on the ballot. You must be an intelligent, chronic, and serious voter uh, when it comes to the issues that are at hand. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I am going to uh, turn it back over to our esteemed Ms. Lily, uh, who is going to close us out. But I wouldn't would be, would be remiss if I do not thank the incredible team at the K4 Center and all the K4 affiliates, as well as the team at Full Circle Strategies. Lily, back over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the panelists. I, I'm just like, I'm still processing everything and I'm so glad we recorded so that we were able to also share <laughs> far and wide with the community who maybe wasn't able to join us today because what we just learned today reminded and the feeling empowers what we need to take with us as we close the, the day. So just some parts that stuck to me was like coming from a surplus mindset and then being able to also run for office yourself, uh, making sure that we're making all our, our work relevant and understanding the facts and knowing the positions. And on that note, I want to give a shout out to my colleagues, Patrick Armstrong, who's on the line, Associate Director of Policy at the Caper Center, and our CEO, Dr. Scott, as we drive this work forward before, during, and after the elections, as it's been noted. And so we want to take this energy of empowerment and determination to see what's on the ballot, but also look at the policy change, right, as, as was shared earlier, the local to the state to the federal level. So on that end, we want to close with a call to action to you all to be able to participate in our national racial equity and tech policy accelerator with our partners at day one. We're actually extending the, the application deadline to November 4th. So if there was issues that you are passionate about, come and learn more. I'll drop the link so you can all participate. Um, share with your community because this is about being able to take the, the energy that we have and converting them into actions that can really impact millions of people <laughs> in our community. So with that said, we'll end there. And I just wanna say thank you to everyone special. Thank you again to all the team behind the scenes that made this happen and to each of you that, that are stayed also through the duration and for the folks who continue to do this work on the ground day by day and day in. So I just wanna say thank you. And so let's get out and mobilize and get our vote and making sure that we are also um, working towards a multi-faith, multi-gen, multi-racial democracy. So thank you so much and we'll see you online. Take care. <laughs>